So good evening. As Peter said, I'm Chris Wilson. I work with Peter on the Chrome Developer Relations team. Um, and together with Ben and Dan, a little later in the evening, uh, we're here to talk about plug-in-free real-time communication with WebRTC. So before I really get going, uh, this entire deck is already live. In fact, I'm running it from the, the network version. Hopefully, I pushed all the changes to it. Um, so you can follow along to it. You can refer to it later, whatever. Please don't run all of the demos while we're in the room, because already I think the Wi-Fi is straining a little bit. Um, and if we all start doing video conferencing, it's really going to strain. <laughs> but, um, but hopefully, it'll be OK. So um, I'm going to kind of lay out the fundamentals of WebRTC, show you what you can do with it, what, it's, what the different pieces are, and how you can use it um, to build applications. And then I'm going to leave some huge areas of detail completely to Ben and Dan. <laughs> um, but first, I wanted to start by kind of the context of where WebRTC came from and what the point was. So WebRTC was really a collaboration to build real-time real communication into web browsers. It was really kind of a response to the fact that um, real-time communication was getting super popular, and it was very proprietary. There were all proprietary systems, proprietary software. You had to have the right system, the right operating system, in order to get anything to work. So we really wanted to have something that, without any plugins or proprietary codecs or things like that, would be free for users and developers to build software on top of and to use. And this was a, obviously a big, huge hole in the web platform at the time. And right up front, I want to be clear, this is peer-to-peer -peer networking. Um, this is not kind of top-down uh, top down networking and top-down communications. And to kind of demonstrate that, um, I wanted to introduce one of my peers, actually, whom uh, some of you may recognize. And hang on here just a second. Come on. Oh, there we are. <laughs> the captain. Are you there? Ah, oh, you're muted. Oh. All right, well, he's obviously cleaned himself up a bit, but he's been sitting there waiting for us for 20 minutes or so. Anyhow, so. <laughs> New Oops. Blast, by the way. This is uh, the new, actually, we talked about that, trying to do one. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, Colt is actually at home with his kids right now. Uh, so obviously, we're doing quite a few steps to get, to get over there. But in the past, a lot of real-time communications was built around this kind of system, a very centralized server managing all the communications, running all the communication, all the media streams through that server. And obviously, this doesn't really scale super well um, for multiple reasons. It's kind of inefficient and expensive, but also the centralized model, as we've discovered with the web, doesn't work super well. Like We need a, a more uh, direct communication model. So WebRTC is peer-to-peer. -peer. It has this big, nice, fluffy cloud right in the middle. Um, that should make you feel better about it. But we'll find out, actually, the fluffy cloud is hiding some things that might not be quite so simple. But we'll get to that part. Keep this image in mind. Uh, it helps make me feel better, at least. So when I say RT WebRTC, um, I should explain that WebRTC is not actually just one specification. It's kind of a collective solution built from a bunch of different pieces, from a, a wide litany, actually, of pieces that come together, like RTC Web and the, uh, the JavaScript session exchange um, from IETF, WebRTC and media streams from the W3C, the Jingle, uh, Jingle the Opus and VP8 codex. I mean, all of these pieces that kind of have to come together and work together in order to build a real-time communication system. Now, of course, with all of these required pieces, with a bunch of, you know, this is actually not even close to the entire list of things that WebRTC includes in one way or another. 
this might seem kind of fragile or kind of this probably only works on the latest version of Chrome on one operating system with particular hardware or something like that. And that was kind of my impression of it at one point. But I have to say, this actually is not true at all. Um, I've, been, I've been playing around with it quite a bit, obviously, lately. And um, although there are some rough edges, uh, WebRTC actually does work across Chrome, Chrome for Android, uh, Firefox, Firefox for Android, um, although they're, they're still working on polishing some of the, the Android version. Um, Opera, as well, has been very involved in WebRTC even prior to their, their change over to Chromium. And we also have some native bits and pieces that, that work well. And to demonstrate this, I actually wanted to, whoops, clicking the wrong button. Let's see if we can, uh, can get this working. I'm gonna try connecting to this session from my Android device here. And, oh, oh. Please don't anyone else type in faster than me. <laughs> it only lets one person in. Which has created some problems too. Okay, so there you go, wave to yourselves. So you can prove I'm not faking this. Um, and you know, this is not, better hang out before I start feeding back here. This is not something, uh, something that I cooked up especially for this, uh, this demo or anything. This is actually just the standard um, full-blown AppRTC demo that we've been using for quite a while. Okay. Um, in addition to Chrome, Firefox, and Opera, and some native bindings um, in Java and Objective-C, um, we also uh, have noted that the Qt framework is moving to Chromium, which means they're picking up WebRTC, so this kind of cross-platform device native embedded application platform is also picking up WebRTC. Um, and putting all of these pieces together, like all of the, the, uh, the endpoints, the, the platforms that support WebRTC today, today we have approximately a little bit over actually, one billion WebRTC users. Like we have one billion people out there who can use WebRTC without even upgrading their platform or anything like that. Like this is already ready, it's already there for a billion people, which is a really big number. Um, actually, I think at the height of when I was on the IE team, we had about three quarters of a billion users and the web has just grown a lot since then. But this gives you an idea of the size of the opportunity out there with WebRTC and the fact that it's already ready and already out there. In fact, uh, back in August, I think this was announced a while ago, uh, V-Line facilitated this, uh, this first live TV interview. Yeah, I, I can hear the fans, the, the, the team members. Um, the first live TV interview for Sky News over WebRTC. So, you know, typically live TV interview setups look more like this huge camera, lots of equipment, lots of staff, and instead, this was the setup they used, like basically a video podcasting setup. I think I actually have that webcam. Oh good, not me. So that's kind of the vision and the scope of uh, what you can use RTC for. So I wanna dig into how it works and how the pieces fit together and show some more, some different kinds of demos actually. So real-time communication basically breaks down into four main tasks. There's kind of acquiring or getting access to the local video or audio stream. So how do you get access to the webcam? How do you get access to the microphone? And then once you have it, you have to establish a connection with someone else, and then you have to communicate this stream of data over to this other person somewhere out in the cloud, um, including not only audio and video, but also arbitrary data. You wanna be able to just communicate um, a channel of data that might be your own private application data. In order to facilitate this, WebRT WebRTC has three main JavaScript APIs. Media streams, or get user media, uh, RTC peer connection, and RTC data channel. And I'm gonna talk about each of these three. Um, you'll notice there are three, not four. That's actually because uh, the RTC peer connection wraps together the steps of making connections and um, communicating media streams. 
So I'm going to start with my personal favorite, actually, is media streams and acquiring local audio and video. And, and I'm sure some of you out there know I'm kind of the web audio guy um, in the, the developer relations team at Chrome. Um, so I'm definitely going to talk a little, whoops, a little bit about that. But a media stream represents a stream of synchronized media. Um, it can contain multiple tracks inside it. They can be audio or video tracks. You can have multiple, uh, multiple of each of them, actually. But typically, you have an audio track um, or, and or a video track. And of course, um, uh, of course, audio tracks inside that are typically more than one actual stream of data. You can have stereo, uh, stereo data inside it. The way that you get one of these media streams is with this API called Get User Media. Um, how many of you have actually used Get User Media before, like in an application? OK, so a few at least. Get User Media is actually fairly simple to, to use, to, to grab a media stream. Like once you have to do something with it, it's a little bit different. All you really do is call navigator.getUserMedia. You pass it a constraints object that says, in this case, right up here towards the top, it says video colon true. I'm just asking, give me a video object. Like, give me a stream of video. Don't care where it comes from. Um, just give it to me. So this will, this, this will basically grab the default camera attached to my laptop and hand back a stream of that data. Now, of course, once you have that stream of data, you probably want to do something with it. But we're not talking about you know, doing the actual real-time communication across the network yet. So the very first thing that you can do is simply have a video element on your page, assign the source to that stream that you got, and you will actually have your own stream of data rendered on the screen. So if I open this guy up and give it access to my camera, hi. And all this did was actually exactly this code. Like I set the video source to a stream of data that I asked for with Get User Media. Now, you will notice, by the way, um, it popped a little uh, permissions bar up at the top. I want to briefly talk about that. So, User Media will always prompt you for per prompt the user for permission to access the camera or the audio device. We don't want people like arbitrary web pages spying on you by looking at your camera or uh, listening in on your microphone or anything. If you are on HTTPS and the user allows it, um, it will only prompt you once the first time. You will always see, actually I should have, uh, should have made a point of this. Once you're um, on a page that has access, you'll see in the, in the URL bar up here, it says this page is accessing your camera. It will also say this page is accessing your, mic your uh, audio input and show you a little microphone. If I click on this, I can say, hey, block camera access. Um, then it will stop asking me for this app. You can obviously manage these settings. But that's not super interesting right now. So um, Chrome applications, you can actually ask for audio and video permissions, and then you won't get prompted. Uh, you can, as I, as I showed, actually change the permissions afterwards, too. Uh, one final note on permissions. You actually cannot use get user media from a fi file colon URL. So if you're playing around with this, run your stuff on a server. That's just kind of standard. A lot of uh, sort of application-y APIs are only available from non-file URIs um, for security reasons. Now, that's kind of cool, I suppose. Like you got access to the camera, showed it on the screen, but you actually want to generally do something with it. You either want to pass it uh, remotely or you want to process it in some way. And it's actually fairly easy to, to do that. Now this application is actually pulling in um, and frame grabbing screens from user media. And then it's copying a frame at a time to a canvas and analyzing the pixels in the canvas. And then it's using that to create a, oh, it got dark in here. I tested this earlier, but you can kind of see it. And then it's using that to generate an ASCII image from that. So you can basically do whatever you want to with this, uh, with this processing. Like you can get access to the actual bits in the image in the, the video stream. And if you, yeah. 
So interestingly enough, uh, good question. Um, ask again at the end, actually. The short answer is you can, but it requires a few more pieces. So the basic point here is once you get a, a media stream, you can actually do processing on it as well as pass it to other, other sources or other destinations, I mean. Um, I'm not actually going to go into this super deeply here. I'm going to skip the demo, actually, because it feeds back really badly. But um, as those of you who may have seen my previous work know, I've done a lot with web audio. And Get User Media can actually just grab an audio stream, too. It doesn't need to be a video stream. Um, if you ask for a Get User Media and you just give it the constraints of audio true and not video, um, you will get back a stream. You can create a media source node from that stream in web audio, and then party on on processing whatever audio you're getting in from the system. The super cool thing about this, uh, from my perspective, is it's very low latency on good systems. And so you can use it for actual musical applications, which is kind of cool. Uh, so I would encourage you to click this link, not right now. <laughs> Because um, it does feedback really badly, unfortunately. Uh, it depends on the room, and I was hoping it would work well tonight. But. Um, you also have the ability, and I'm going to skip some of the, the demos here, but I wanted people to be able to click on them and try them out. You have the ability to uh, set constraints that let you choose the resolution. So this demo actually lets you choose between a low quality camera image, like a low you know, 320 by 240 image versus a full-on HD image. So the same camera, you can ask it for a different resolution. And you can also select the mic and the camera. This one is actually, oh, this is going to be boring on this machine, actually, because I don't think I have multiple. So I only have the built-in mic and a single camera. <laughs> Shoot, I was playing with this earlier on my desktop, which has like you know six different audio inputs to it, which uh, is a little more interesting there. Um, all right, sorry. There's also a bunch of work underway to make this a little more user focused. It doesn't just say default mic or you know line input one or a USB ID or something like that. You really want to be able to say, give me whatever the user thinks is the front facing camera or the device thinks is the front facing camera or the rear facing camera. Like this is this is giving you the selfie mode, right? It's the ability to figure out at a higher level what the inputs are. Um, you know, which your headphones are versus your headset versus your uh, built-in microphone or things like that. You can also do these, any of these constraints you can change dynamically through the API as well. So last bit on get user media, um, and then we're going to move on to the, the RTC peer connections, is um, in Chrome at least you can actually use this to do screen capture. You can ask for a Chrome media source of screen and instead of giving you a video feed, this gives you basically a video feed from the screen. So I can go click on this guy. Come on. Hmm. I should be able to click on that. Oh, wrong note. Mm -hmm. Wrong link. Here we go. Please tell me I enabled this. Oh. Oh. I'm not going to restart this. So, Anyhow, you can get a video source of your screen. Again, I forgot to enable it in here, but I don't want to restart the browser and everything. Um, you do have to enable it today in Chrome. To, but this gives you a quick and easy way to build, basically, you know, Hangouts on top of WebRTC, which one can guess is an interesting thing to do. Particularly, um, you can use this to do IT support for your family, which is why I'm really excited about it. <laughs> Most of my family lives, you know, a thousand miles away, and I'm still tech support somehow. <laughs> okay, so we talked about kind of the first chunk, which is how you grab sources of data on your system. Now I want to talk about um, the second part, which is doing the actual communication, figuring out how to connect to someone, and passing data back and forth. So this is done via an API called RTC Peer Connection. Um, this is kind of what sets up everything. And on the surface, this is 
kind of, kind of easy. You get access to a media stream. So you ask get user media for an audio and video stream. You get back a media stream. And then you just kind of plug it into an RTC peer connection. And you know, you're pretty much done. So we can stop now. Thanks. Good night. <laughs> OK, actually, um, it's way more complex than that. And I intentionally made this kind of small so you can't really read it. This is the, um, the, the diagram of what RTC peer connection actually connects to. Um, and it does a bunch more stuff that is really barely covered by this. It does things like you know, echo cancellation and uh, noise reduction, compressing data through codecs, of course, and doing that adaptively depending on what stream you, uh, you have, setting up the peer-to-peer -peer path uh, pathway through NATs and firewalls, which we will talk about a little bit. But there's a lot of moving parts under this hood, is what I'm trying to get at. And fortunately, most of this is abstracted away. In fact, that is the last time, well, this is the last time I'm going to say the words echo cancellation during this talk, because you don't have to think about it. It's just going to kind of happen for you in the stream, and you don't have to worry about it. You create an RTC peer connection. You add your media stream to it, and you call up a couple methods that set the right parameters. And now the problem is, well, there's actually a lot more to that fluffy cloud than just a connection, because you have to know where to connect to. And even the fact that I'm typing in a, a specialized number in that AppRTC engine, that just gives an identifier. That's kind of like saying, what room do I want to go in? But there's a ton of other stuff that has to be effectively negotiated between these two endpoints. Like, they have to figure out, well, what codec do you support? What codec do I support? You know, do you want an you know, what, what do you want in the stream? How do I get to you on the network? Like, I simplified things a little bit because it was faster um, that both of my devices that I've connected to were on the same Wi-Fi. But when I connected to Colt, you know, he's a long way away, and I'm pretty sure his home has a firewall, you know, has a network address, translation, router. Um, at least, you know, I haven't managed to hack into it yet, so I'm, I'm guessing. So we need to make this little detour. And I need to own up to the fact that although WebRTC is peer-to-peer, -peer, you still kind of need servers to initiate that connection. Um, you know, the problem here basically is it's just not scalable to, to like shout into the great internet of, hey, I want to exchange streaming media data with my buddy who's you know, 600 miles that way, and expect it knows how to communicate with him, and that you're going to negotiate between the two systems, which may be running different operating systems and have different sets of things. Like you, you need some kind of communication between them before you set up the actual stream communication. So we have this process called signaling. And signaling is the way that we coordinate that communication. We kind of set up and communicate back and forth. And the interesting thing about signaling in WebRTC um, is that it's not a single process necessarily. Like you can hard code pizza, pieces of this if you want, but then it's going to shut off certain scenarios as well. It's kind of like making a phone call where you just pick up the phone and you punch a number in and it makes a connection. And that seems like a very simple thing to do. And in the, the very olden days, it was relatively simple because there was a physical connection between those two places. There was a wire that you could follow the chain of the wire all the way through. But you had awful audio quality when you were calling across the country. Um, I still actually do remember international calls that were bad quality, at least. Um, but today, that's all routing. Like, that's all digital systems that are communicating about what they can support and making sure that they can negotiate that through there. And, and WebRTC is kind of the same thing. Now, the details of this communication aren't really that important for your application that you're building. Like, you don't really care what codecs are being used as long as, you can, as long as it can happen, right? as long as the communication can get set up. So the mechanism is kind of up to your application as to how it enables that. Um, it can use WebSockets or XHR or whatever. There are a bunch of, of um, ways to do it that are sort of baked already, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But this is where the JavaScript session establishment protocol also comes into play. Like you can see how this basically happens is uh, the, one of the applications, the caller, communicates up in the app to, uh, with the session description and passes it up into the cloud to a server somewhere. 
and that communicates down to the callee. And once they've figured out, once they've negotiated that, the peer-to-peer -peer link at the bottom gets established. And this is purely between the two endpoints. It has nothing to do with the server anymore. They figured out how to drill through any NATs, any firewalls along the way, and that sort of thing. So the RTC peer connection, one of its tasks is to take care of this initialization. It checks with the, the local media capabilities, uh, checks what the network landscape is and that sort of thing for that system. And then it exchanges this via a signaling mechanism. And um, this simple peer-to-peer -peer example is, I only included the link here because it's hilarious that this is called the simple peer-to-peer -peer example. Um, it's not that simple. Uh, when you're doing signaling, signaling is a relatively significant process if you want it to be really flexible between systems. However, there are, as I mentioned, a bunch of ways to do this, and there are some somewhat standardized versions of this. Uh, we actually had a code lab at Google I.O. that was building a Node.js server that did this signaling mechanism. So you can do this with Node and Socket I.O. Um, this actually had the, the concept of rooms in it as well, which was pretty cool. So there's tons of resources out there to figure out how to do this. Awesome. There you go. So we're, that's going to be the hack day. Um, in case you're wondering, by the way, the insides of an RTC session description look like this. I'm sure you've all absorbed all the information from this. Uh, the, the basic point is this is a bunch of very compressed information um, that is not something that an app developer typically wants to have to, to deal with. The great thing is you typically don't have to deal with it. Like Reb, WebRTC is really designed so that um, this stuff will happen for you in the signaling process. And you just have to figure out how to do signaling for your application. And there are some libraries built in that will do that. Yeah? Once the, the session is established, is the session server needed at that point? No, actually, at all. Um, in fact, if you have a really direct example, like if you have a uh, on your own machine, for example, where you know everything is the same, you don't need to negotiate anything, you can get away with not having a signaling server at all. Um, we actually have some, some samples. I think they're linked, uh, linked in here as well. So then, Part of the session description is basically candidates for, hey, this is one way you could communicate with me. This is another way you could communicate with me. And these two machines, these two endpoints are effectively trading this through the server. And then once they've picked one, the server gets out of the way and you're not communicating through there anymore. Um, I did want to mention, incidentally, that we recently now have the ability to use the output of one RTC peer connection as the input to another one. I only mention this because it sets up, up some kind of cool capabilities of using a peer connection, a WebRTC application, to route calls, to like communicate between different systems. And you can set up one system that will switch between multiple peers, which is kind of interesting. Now at this point, I've dumped a ton of detail on you, and you're probably thinking, my head really hurts. Well, don't worry about it because Ben is going to get up here and he's going to talk a ton more about all of this stuff in RTC peer connection and signaling, and he's going to make your head hurt even more. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, like I mentioned, you can do RTC peer connections without any signaling, but this really does only work on a single machine or an extremely tightly controlled network environment and machine environment. Like you, you need to not have any negotiation and hard code things like what codec are we using to communicate, which obviously is a little bit dangerous to do. Um, this is an interesting demo to look at though, mostly because um, this basically lets you learn about RTC peer connection and the media flow without thinking about signaling, like without having to wrap your head around signaling. And in fact, just going to go ahead and start this up. And all it really does is it calls itself. So I let it. And let's. OK, so 
although you probably can't tell from there, the one, one of these images is lower quality than the other slightly because it's routing it through the, the communication. Um, now the interesting bit here though, is if you look at the console for this application, the console has tons of data and it shows you what's happening in the media stream. Like this is a great way to go in and understand how this media flow works um, and debug just that part without having to worry about the signaling setup. Okay, however, once you really wanna understand and drill into how WebRTC can be used to build a full application, um, including signaling, the best place to start, honestly, uh, aside from the code lab, which I think actually is a very good place to start, is um, this sort of canonical example app, the AppRTC, uh, that I've been using for most of these demos. And this does have signaling built into it. Uh, it's provided by XHR and Data Channel, so it kind of wraps everything together. So, speaking of Data Channel, the last bit that I want to mention, the last major bit that I wanted to mention, is that last of the four steps, which is exchanging arbitrary data. So we talked about how to grab local media and um, get a stream and then do some signaling to create a connection, and then you basically just assign the stream and it deals with it from there. But there's also the ability to use WebRTC and this, this channel that you've set up to communicate arbitrary data back and forth. And I was looking at this and thinking about this earlier today and realizing that um, back before I was lamentably involved in IE 2.0, um, I actually wrote this network space dogfight game with a bunch of my college friends, and this was in about 1992, um, before we really even had a network library. We were actually like rolling our own at the code level uh, from the NCSA Telnet code. And it was great, it was really cool, we got it to work, we would have these like very early LAN parties before anyone even knew what a LAN party was where we would literally go in with a ton of, of desktop computers and set up you know, the hard wiring. And the problem was our networking was super fragile um, because we were doing like actual TCP IP directly ourselves and passing packets back and forth and we had to set up the network topology ourselves and worry about, well, if somebody drops out, what do we do? Um, and the answer was generally, well, you just dump everybody out to a command line. Um, RTC data channel is actually a really easy way to do that without having to write your own TCP IP code, which is kind of, uh, would have been nice back then. But basically, if you have an, R, um, an RTC peer connection, if you set up a, a communication channel, you can say, I want to communicate arbitrary data. And what you get is actually the same API as WebSockets. So if you've been building a sockets-based application, porting it to RTC data channel and WebRTC is actually really easy to do. Um, you have the same kind of very low latency characteristics. Uh, you can get, some, get an unreliable connection if that's what you want. You don't have to, like there's guaranteed delivery as well. Um, I'm gonna talk about security in a minute, so I'm not even gonna mention it there. <laughs> so this is an RTC data channel example. Um, you can tell it basically sets up, if I can find my cursor, it creates a data, uh, creates an RTC peer connection, it creates a um, what to do when I get a data channel, which effectively is, well, remember it and set its on message so when you get a message you do something with it. And then it can also send on a channel down there. It just calls send with some data. So super straightforward, you know, it's binary data, so you can pass whatever you want to it in the data channel. Um, and it has built-in flow control, so you don't need to roll all of your own stuff there either. Since we're running late, I'm gonna skate past several demos of this, since I'm sure actually Dan is gonna talk about it too. Um, and I wanna talk about security. So one of, I actually was gonna cut this whole section, and Sam Dutton, who uh, is my team member who works in, in London and is really the super hardcore WebRTC guy on, on the DevRel team, uh, he gets really, really excited by this. He was like, you can't cut that. Like, I get this question all the time. 
about WebRTC, what about security? So I definitely wanted to leave it in. Um, and it, it actually is kind of an interesting story. So WebRTC actually has mandatory encryption on the data channels, on, on the media channels, I should say. Data channel sounds like I'm talking about the arbitrary data channel. All of the media and data gets encrypted. So once you have a connection to another endpoint, your connection between those two points is always encrypted. Um, we also, of course, as I mentioned before, the user has to opt in for you to get access to the local media stuff. And of course, we run in a sandbox just like everything else in Chrome, so it's not gonna, you're not gonna tank the whole machine. The one thing that I did wanna mention, though, is, this, is that the signaling mechanisms, as I mentioned before, the signaling mechanisms are somewhat custom, like you can build your own signaling mechanism. And it's up to you to make that signaling secure because if an attacker manages to insert themselves into that um, and hijack the signaling, they can get you to connect to somewhere else or get your user endpoints to connect to someone else. Um, there are some secure protocols you can use there. In fact, just using HTTPS to do your signaling will likely get you most of the way there um, to keep from getting your messages inter intercepted. Uh, but you do want to do something like this, where you've secured the signaling path as well as the data channel path, which gets encrypted to begin with. So enough about security. Uh, I also wanted to rip out the voice slide, but Sam said I, I should really mention this. And it is kind of important that when I talked about you know, grabbing the local media stream of audio, keep in mind, you can use a WebRTC, uh, an RTC peer connection, and just give it an audio stream. Like, this is how to do telephony over the web in an open and interoperable way, like using the Opus Audio codec, using these endpoints, and not having to roll your own adaptive audio system to push that data across. And as the web audio guy, I keep getting people saying, well, I want to stream audio, so how should I do that? I should, like, you know, create a gigantic buffer and just loop it and keep inserting parts or what? And I'm like, you haven't mentioned adaptive yet, and that really worries me because you know, there's a lot to doing any kind of, of audio or video communication um, across a real network rather than just across the room uh, that you just don't want to mess with. This turns voice into really just another JavaScript application. And I thought this was kind of a cool quote. This was in Sam's previous deck. And then I saw who made it. It's the CTO of the FCC. Like, this guy kind of knows about communications and their impact in the industry. And that kind of highlights, like, this, this is a major impact thing, being able to do these things in open and interoperable ways. Um, I did also want to mention very briefly, WebRTC is actually a set of standards that are usable from the web. They don't wrap the web up, and you can actually have WebRTC endpoints that, um, that are not browsers that don't support the entire stack of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on the other end. So you could, you could create a phone that uses the audio stuff from Web, WebRTC and is connectable via WebRTC without building an entire browser stack inside it as well. And there are a bunch of projects doing things like that, which I'm going to skip. So um, as you look at developing with WebRTC, super briefly, we have a bunch of WebRTC internals that we expose. We have lots of logging and stuff like that that's super useful. There, uh, we have an adapter that lets you use the same code across browsers. This really, this isn't a huge deal. It's mostly, it removes vendor prefixing and kind of uh, abstracts some of the minor differences as we've been working together with the Firefox guys and it minimizes some of the spec churn. This is actually getting less and less important over time, but is still kind of interesting so far. And now, by this point, you've probably said your brain has already exploded because I've pumped so much stuff in there. And this is, by the way, just the overview talk. Um, this is just the intro. Um, but there are plenty of frameworks and plenty of, of samples out there and example code that really give you some good ideas and give you the frameworks to start building some super, super cool things. Like, don't, don't be a thrown by all of the detail here and all of the complexity, because it's pretty easy to put something together and start communicating between two different endpoints, even across a broad network, which is kind of cool. 
So lots of libraries to start using uh, to do peer-to-peer -peer data and voice, or sorry, and video communication. Loads more resources. Uh, this is everything from the last I.O. presentation through all of the things we've ever mentioned in, in HTML5 rocks. There's a WebRTC book as well. Um, lots of ways to contact the WebRTC community. <sighs> I'm running out way over time, so I'm trying to move, move quickly. So really, what I wanted to do tonight was get you excited about the interesting opportunities that WebRTC presents. Like, this really does have transformational capabilities to real-time communications, and it can help humanize computer communication as well, which I find super exciting. And with that, uh, here's my contact info, but also another link to the slides. Um, that way you can get to all the demos that I didn't have time to, to hit. Big round of applause for her. Thank you. Aww. Oh, my very own.